Welcome to the Clear the Shelf podcast with Chris and Chris, the show that meets at the intersection of education and entertainment to discuss online arbitrage, retail arbitrage, wholesale, and all facets of selling on Amazon. We'll bring you news, tactics, strategies, insights, stories, and interviews to help you grow your Amazon business. And now, here are your hosts, Chris Grant and Chris Rasick. What is going on, Amazon sellers, and welcome back to the Clear the Shelf podcast with myself and my sylph-like co-host, Chris Rasick. Uh, and for those of you who, who don't know, I am digging deep into the American lexicon to come up with some of these adjectives every week. Uh, it's, getting, it's getting harder and harder. Uh, but today, we're going to be discussing uh, a one bias and one principle that you should probably be aware of. Uh, and, and you can even use these in your Amazon business to be a better seller, to be a better entrepreneur. Uh, and just to put a name to these, we're going to be discussing the spotlight effect, number one. And number two, we're going to be discussing Occam's razor. Uh, but before we get into this, if you've listened to the show, you already know that this show is not free. We don't hide the show behind a paywall or make you opt in for any of the content that we produce. However, this show will cost you something. Uh, if you find some value in this episode or any of the episodes that we've put out, please give us the equivalent of a digital fist bump and hit the follow button on your favorite podcast player. Hit subscribe over on YouTube uh, because as we see the pod rise in the charts and we see the number of subs go up on YouTube, uh, it gives us just enough dopamine to come back and do this all over again uh, and make more episodes for you guys. Uh, so please go and do that now. We would really, really appreciate it. And if you want to, feel free to take a screenshot and share this on social media or in your favorite Facebook group or Discord uh, and let them know what uh, what they're missing out on if they're not already listening to the show. Uh, but now that we've gotten through all that, let's talk a little bit about the spotlight effect uh, and how you can use it in your uh, in your business. Hey guys, I'm interrupting this episode to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Proven Prep Center, for helping us grow the show. Kyle and his team over at Proven Prep Center ensure fast shipping with a set day for your products to be shipped to Amazon, flat rate pricing so you won't be nickeled and dimed for poly bags and other prep items, and they're located in sales tax-free Oregon, and they work with both small and large sellers. They've got low minimum quantity requirements, but also will offer you volume discounts as you grow with them as part of your team. If you want to learn a little bit more about Proven Prep Center, head over to cleartheshelf.com forward slash prep. Now back to the show. Yeah, I've been uh, I've been fascinated with this recently. Um, there's been uh, a couple people are talking about it, and uh, it kind of made me dig into it. Um, so first, let's let's define the spotlight effect. Um, it's a it's a cognitive bias in which people tend to overestimate. Uh, the extent to which their actions and appearance are noticed by others, right? Um, it, it, it's the tendency to believe that, that, you know, your own behavior, your own appearance, or the mistakes that you make are more noticeable and, and more significant to others than they actually are. Um, this is, I, I think it's really neat because it, it has both positive and negative effects. Um, you know, it, the, the presence of it and then the lack of presence of it have kind of unique effects, which you'll notice as we, we go through some of the, the, the points. Um, I was, uh, spot, this is, this is near and dear to me, um, mm -hmm. because uh, I, I've, I, I pretty much have lived my entire life, uh, as if someone's watching me. Um, and, and I, as I've been reading about this, I think I, I think I know the moment that the spotlight effect became branded on my, my person. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I was uh, I was somewhere uh, I was, you know, eight or 10 years old or something like that. And uh, we, we lived in a, a duplex and, and it was but it, it had this gravel driveway. And then you came around the drive and there was a, a, like, I don't know, five or six duplexes there. It was like a little mm -hmm. complex or something like that. Right. So and it was it was wintertime and I had been outside playing and I was like outside for too long right like <laughs> it was that was very very cold right so i came in to change my clothes or whatever take a shower or something like that and i remember uh my 
both butt cheeks were completely numb. Like, like a 100% numb, right? It wasn't worth the only body part. You know, my nose was cold too, but, but like, I, I couldn't feel, so I'm, so I was like, I, I pulled my pants down and I was like, like slapping and grabbing my butt. I couldn't feel a thing. Right. <laughs> and it was, it was winter time. So it got dark early and, and at, at eight or 10 years old or whatever, I didn't realize the effect that at nighttime, what a, a, a room with no curtains closed oh. and, and, the, and the light on, I didn't realize the, the science of that yet. Right. So, <laughs> so, uh, so there I am, like, you know, and I'm, I'm just a hundred percent consumed by, the lack of complete lack of feeling in my butt cheeks. Uh, and you know, like eight to 10 years old, you would be like, well, I hope this isn't permanent. You know, like <laughs> you got all sorts of, and my mom's friend stopped over for dinner or whatever. And, um, so I, I got dressed, I, I got done, you know, fondling my butt cheeks and, and, and got dressed and <laughs> went downstairs. And I don't remember exactly what she said, but it was, incredibly embarrassing and i had no idea that anyone could see the experiment that i was partaking in um <laughs> but i believe that was that was the moment that that the spotlight effect became a a, a permanent uh co-pilot uh, i i feel so bad for eight-year-old chris <laughs> like that you know some some lady seeing you wail away on your own butt yeah, uh, you know that's yep. that's. And horrible. I was I was too embarrassed to to even explain myself. You know, it was like, and like after later that night, you know, I think I was laying in bed going, "Oh, why didn't I just tell her what I?" You know, <laughs> like I, just, I couldn't feel him at all. Like completely, not, you know, it was it was fascinating to me and scary and you know, it, but uh, I was I was too embarrassed. So, um, so that so ever since then, I I have I've assumed that uh. uh someone is, is pulling up the driveway and watching everything that I'm doing. So, you know, it's, it's really funny that you bring up that story because the first time I ever really felt the effects of the spotlight effect, uh, it was, it was also in the snow. Uh, I was, yeah, I was, uh, it would have been, it would have been sixth grade, uh, ski club. I, you know, Mad Mountain, uh, Mad River Mountain in, in Ohio was the place where we went to ski club. And uh, my buddies, uh, my buddies built a, a little jump. And I was not a, I was not a great skier. I was still new. I became a really good skier. I, I became a really good Ohio skier. Let's, I should clarify <laughs> that. Okay. Uh, yeah, Ohio, I was, I was like, you know, top of my game, you go over to, uh, to Pennsylvania. Um, uh, what is it? The mountain over there, uh, spring Valley or spring mountain or something. Yeah. Uh, and then I was just, I was a little, you know, I was a little out of my element, but I could still handle it. Uh, I was, it would be dangerous for me to have skied in like Colorado or anything <laughs> like that. But, uh, you know, my buddies are going over this jump and, I'm like, you know what? They can do it. I got this. Uh, so I, I hit the jump full speed. Uh, and as soon as my skis left the safety of earth, I knew that, that it was, you know, I was going head over tips. Uh, it was not going to end well. Uh, and I, I was at that time, I was not old enough to realize that it was, I could have sworn I could have, you know, said a swear word and, and nobody was going to get me in trouble. Uh, and so I just let out this shriek. Uh, and it was kind of like, shaw. Uh, and then I hit the ground. Uh, and uh, totally, totally bit it. I mean, it was really, really bad. Uh, and then I, you know, I'm a little embarrassed because, oh, it's my, you know, it's it's the boys. You know, they're going to they're gonna give me a little bit of a hard time. I get up, look over to my left, and there's my crush. And she's oh. watching the whole thing. And then she turns and skis away, uh, <laughs> you know. And then the whole bus ride home, the boys are, like, walking past me and going, Shaw! <laughs> uh, so, I, yeah. I'm, gl I'm glad that both of our spotlight effect uh, um, kind of came in the snow. That's, that's nice. 
Yeah, o- Ohio winners were not uh, friendly for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's ah. yeah. Um, I I have a similar experience. I we're getting too far into personal stories, but there was the when we rode bikes uh, and there was a a construction site that they were clearing. They were going to build a house in the neighborhood, and uh, so there were mounds of dirt, and it was in a, a cul de sac. You know, so you can Mm kind of go around the cul-de-sac to build up some speed and then you could hit the construction site and you could hit the mound of dirt and you, you know, you hit the jump. And uh, so, and and I was one of the younger kids, right? Um, So the big kids are just doing all these jumps and it's, you know, coolest thing ever, you know, uh, uh, in my opinion and and whatnot. So, so I decided I work up the courage. I'm going to hit this jump. You know, I want to do this too. And um, so the older kids, are, are giving me some advice. They're like, all right, you know, you want to build up, build up as much speed as you can go around the cul-de-sac. And he goes, you know, and the, and the, the coolest guy in the neighborhood is, you know, obviously the one I'm paying the most attention to. He says, Chris, whatever you do, you don't want a Bronco. And I'm like, I don't know what that is, but I, yeah, <laughs> I don't want, I don't, I don't want a Bronco. And, and he goes, all right. I said, tell me how, I'm, tell me how to make sure I don't Bronco. And he goes, he goes, well, Bronco is you don't want your your front tire to land first, mm-hmm. right? He goes, you got it. You got to make sure your back tire hits first. And I said, oh, Bronco. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I don't want to do that. And he goes, so make sure you pull up on your handlebars when you're in the air, you know, to make sure, you know. And I said, all right. Yeah. Makes sense. He goes, all right. You, all right. You got this. And I don't know if, you know, I secretly, I don't think he had any faith in me whatsoever, but <laughs> So anyway, so so there and the little kid and I it's it's a huffy bike and like my my pedal uh uh shafts weren't even as long as them. So I you like doing this little, you know, and uh so I gotta pedal as fast as I can. I go around the cul-de-sac, right? And I build up speed, and it's probably the fastest I've ever gone on the bicycle. And so I hit the, the construction site, I hit the dirt mound, and I catch some air, my tires leave the ground, and I pull on my handlebars. And I pulled on them so hard that I actually flipped upside down and I landed oh. flat on my back and the bike landed on me. Oh, <laughs> knocked, man. Knocked the wind out of me. Had to have been hilarious to see. I, and clearly it was based on the, the kids' reactions. But uh, I, I did not Bronco. That Yeah, absolutely. It, had I been there, I, I too would have laughed at you, uh, you know, uh, and, and for those of you listening, uh, if, if you guys ever, ever wonder, uh, you know, what the hell's wrong with these guys, uh, they didn't make us wear bike helmets when we were kids, uh, yes, yes, you know, were. and so that, that's what happened. There were undetected concussions involved. That's that <laughs> explains quite a bit. I yeah, like were... I, I was gasping for air, you know, cause the, the, it knocked the wind out of me, but I imagine it was probably one of those where they probably waited to laugh to, to make sure I wasn't dead first. You know, they, right. Like, it's probably one of those. So poke him with a stick to make sure we can laugh. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so, so anyway, spotlight effect. <laughs> that's, that's a heck of a tangent. Right. Um, the, the very first thing that we should talk about with the spotlight effect is, is the fear of failure in and of itself. And, uh, Chris and I both just offered two very good examples of, of how, you know, that fear of failure can, uh, can pretty easily become overwhelming, you know, because of things that have happened in your childhood, things that have happened as a young adult, things like, you know, uh, but we put way too much weight on it. Uh, and I'm going to say a, a couple of things here. One, it, we do worry what others are going to think of well, what is our spouse going to think? What is our, what are our kids going to think? What's our family going to think? Even if you're doing something like selling on Amazon or having a side hustle, uh, you know, and you're kind of really keeping it hush hush to make sure, you know, nobody knows, uh, that fear still creeps in, you know, I, I've got, I've got projects I work on, you know, right now that I have not told anybody about, uh, not Chris, not my wife, not anybody. Uh, and, and that it's because that fear of failure is still there for me. Uh, and I'm like, well, if I just work on this in secret and, you know, maybe, uh, maybe it works and, and then I can share it. Um, you know, but the thing is, is and I think this is something that's, that's great about, uh, I don't know, the, um, the American culture, uh, if you will, is that nobody really cares. You know, uh, you think about, 
you think about some of the greats, uh, the great entrepreneurs through history, they typically have a string of failures before they end up hitting it big. And nobody gives a crap you know, about all the things they failed out. Man, I just listened to a podcast about uh, a guy by the name of uh, Zeckerman, or I believe is his last name. A uh, guy built essentially one of the biggest uh, real estate empires in New York City. Uh, nobody really knows who he is these days, but up until he really hit it big in the meatpacking district of New York City, uh, he he failed all over. He had, a, he had a failed marriage. He had failed businesses, uh, you know, and he didn't see success until he was in his fifties. Uh, and to be honest, he, he drank most of his money away while he was younger. Uh, but still nobody cared when he was worth 75, 125 million, uh, in real estate holdings. They only cared that he had become a success. Uh, you know, so I guess the biggest thing for me is to remember that kind of thing. Uh, I remember the, the failures of Thomas Edison, you know, of Zeckerman, of Sam Zell, of all these guys who made it way bigger than I know I ever will, uh, and just relentlessly keep after it, keep after it. And I don't know, you just have to push through that fear work scared essentially. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it, it's not. It's not dissimilar to um, I shared that story of uh, uh, the very first job that I got when I left the restaurant industry, when, when I quit being a bartender and tried to get a, a big boy job. Um, mm -hmm. It was at a, a, a mortgage broker um, and I, I got licensed as a loan officer and they um, they sat me down. They gave me a desk and a phone book and a legal pad. And they said, write down 200 people, you know, no less than 200. Uh, and if you think you don't know 200 people, you do figure it out. Right. Uh, so then after you made your list of 200 people, you had to call them all and, and explain what you were doing. Um, great for them. They got 200 free leads per new hire, you know, um, but it was miserable, you know, like, like cold calling. I, I don't think anybody has a rosy opinion of cold calling period, nope. uh, but it's even worse when you, first do it <laughs> you know it's it's there's so many no's and so many awkward conversations with you know the the landlord that i used to have when i was uh you know checking my numb butt cheeks in that duplex i called him you know it was it, it was just weird conversations right and it's a ton of no's and uh um you know and they told me they gave me good advice that i use in my my sourcing now as well you know and they they said uh yeah, you're only going to you're only gonna hit a certain percentage of the people that you call, whatever that number ends up being. It's going to be low. Um, they said, but make sure you keep fighting through the list because every no is one step closer to your next yes. You know, and, and it's uh, just the numbers are the numbers. And and um, and that's what I use sourcing as well. You know, it's, it's one of the pieces of advice that I wish. If I received it, I wish I had paid more attention to when I was first starting out was um, how many duds that you're going to go through before you find good leads. You know, it, it's, it's a smaller percentage than I think a lot of new, new sellers realize uh, that, that you're going to have to research if you're manually sourcing or, you know, going through a sale, there's, there's going to be a bunch of junk, you know, that, that just doesn't fit your criteria. Um, so I use that same philosophy, like, you know, every dud is one step closer to the next winner, you know, the next bang or lead, you know, that, that I'm eventually going to find. Um, so, uh, so yeah. And then, you know, we both have stories of, of you know, going full time, you know, of, of leaving the rat race, you know, and, and, or even starting an Amazon store. How many, uh, you know, uh, how many timid new sellers do we see on social media sites, you know, that, that you can tell they're, they're, they're so hesitant and you can't tell me that at least part of that hesitancy is the fear of failure, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the fear of being judged on that failure. But, uh, but you're absolutely right that, you know, look at great people through history that have massive accomplishments. And, and um, you know, if you dig deep enough and, and it's not going to take you long, but there's going to be a list of tons of failures, you know, um, it's just uh, it, it's something and no one and you're not being judged as hard as, as you think you are. You know, it, it's, um, you know, 
if you tried uh, a pyramid scheme, you know, uh, 10 years ago, you know, no one's no one's going to throw that in your face if you say, hey, I'm going to try selling on Amazon, you know. <laughs> right. So. But yeah, so that's that's the big one with the spotlight effect, for sure. Um, mm-hmm. Another uh, another uh, uh, key uh, situation where, where the spotlight effect can can alter um, your success would be networking. Uh, we've talked about how important networks are. Um, you know, it's, it's most of the, most of the value that I I've, I've created in this space is, is due either directly or indirectly from my network. Um, but if you let the spotlight effect get the better of you, um, you know, we, we may feel that, uh, uh, you know, people are judging if, you know, say you're going to reach out and and try to DM somebody, you know, you want to make some personal conversations and then you say, Hey, you know, um, you know, I want to talk to these people. And, and, you know, if you, if you let the spotlight effect could keep you from sending a DM, you know, and, 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 you know, you're going to be hesitant to, to approach others or, you know, share an idea that, that you have with them. Um, you know, so, so it's important if you understand it's the spotlight effect and tell yourself people aren't judging you as hard as you think they are. Um, you know, it, it's key to not let the spotlight effect keep you from the attempt, you know, that's uh, uh that can be real important with networking right absolutely yeah uh, another and i don't know i think i think this next one might go kind of hand in hand with networking a little bit marketing uh spotlight spotlight effect can definitely uh take a toll and here's a little personal anecdote uh, you know, the OE challenge is about to get started in, in another, uh, I don't know, almost a week from now. And so, of course, we are marketing, we're pushing it uh, right now. And, you know, I always get a little, I always get a little worried, uh, you know, if I, if I push this too hard, uh, you know, are people going to, you know, get irritated, frustrated with me, that kind of thing. And sure enough, it never never comes to light, you know, never, never happens. Nobody, you know, there might be one or two people are like, you know what, I've gotten enough of these emails. Uh, can you please knock it off? But those are yeah, based on the amount of emails that I send out or the amount of social media posts that I make or uh, things like that. It's a very, very small percentage. Uh, every, everyone else is kind of like, yeah, this is, this is part of the OA challenge. They've got to get the word out. Uh, and so everyone seems to understand. Uh, and so if, Let's say, for example, that you are going to uh, maybe build a brand, maybe, you know, go into private label a little bit or things like that. Uh, you know, you might be worried about what kind of attention your brand is going to get. Or if you decide that you want to offer maybe a product or a service, you know, Chris has leads list that he sells. Uh, you know, you can you can allow that fear because of the spotlight effect to not actually take action when you you probably should you know it might put you a little bit out of your comfort zone uh you know to have some sort of offer outside of just uh selling stuff on amazon but uh you know if you make a mistake chances are people are not really going to judge you over it you know you can and you will probably have the opportunity to fix it uh, and the one thing i actually recently learned where you can actually use the spotlight effect uh, in your favor is uh, in like social media video shorts and uh, reels and you know uh, TikTok videos. Actually, uh, was told this from someone who goes viral on a fairly regular basis. Uh, but they're like, you know, you put those words down at the bottom of your your videos uh, so people can read along when they don't have the sound on. And they said misspell a couple of the words. And for those people who are actually paying attention and actually reading that, there's going to be a certain percentage of them who will say, you spelled this wrong, you got this number wrong, you put the comma in the wrong place, and you then get the comments, and then you can go in and start using that as, uh, you know, to show the algorithm that your content actually is getting some, some feedback, some, you know. Uh, but you can, so you can actually use this kind of thing to your advantage in some cases. Uh, and so I thought that was really fascinating. I, I, it's not worth the, the clicks or the, the virality to intentionally misspell something. I, I, I'm not (laughs) wired that way. I can't do it. (laughs) 
Um, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, the private label or designing a product or, or whatnot. Um, yeah, you talk about specifically that product design, you know, um, say you're going to get into, uh, you know, private label or, or something like that, maybe. And, uh, you know, the spotlight effect can can be relevant um, as you design the product or as you're thinking about uh, uh, the product you're going to create. Um, you know, you may overestimate the importance of certain features, um, you know, or, or design elements. Um, and, and you could actually overdo it thinking that there's so much tensions and, and such scrutiny to, to every last little bit um, to where, you know, the maybe the simple answer uh, would have been better. You know, you can easily overthink it uh, as a result of the spotlight effect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next up, let's talk a little bit about employee management. Yeah, you know, it's it's very it's natural. Uh, for sellers and other entrepreneurs to assume that maybe their employees or subordinates are paying really close attention to their their every move uh, or your every decision, uh, and and honestly, this can this kind of leads you to micromanaging, uh, you know, uh, worrying about what they're doing because you think they're worried about every single thing that that you're doing. And let me just tell everyone out there now. Your employees are more interested in beating their high score in uh, Minesweeper than they are about your every move. Uh, I can guarantee that. Uh, you know, and and micromanaging. If you if you go down the path of micromanaging because you're uh, worried about what your employees or your VAs or or your team members might think, uh, it's one. It will not make for a great work environment. Uh, people people typically do not like to be micromanaged, uh, and two, it can actually make you as the owner or the you know the seller uh, much less effective, you know, uh, because you're spending your time redoing the work that may already be done well enough, uh, or you know paying super close attention to uh, what everyone's doing and and not focusing on what you should be doing. Or, or what you should be working on and what you hired your team uh, to do, which is give you back more time. Um, and, and that's, I, I don't know. I, I have seen that in action. You know, one of my bosses was a micromanager to the point where they would literally watch me over the shoulder while I would do things. Uh, you know, and, and I would bring it up in a, in a gentle way. Like, you know that you, you pay me to do this but you watching over my shoulder, like that wastes your time. Like, let me show you the finished product. Um, that, that fell on deaf ears, you know, but it certainly happens. Yeah. And then, you know, what about the effect that, uh, you know, some business owners and, 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 you know, sellers, if you're hiring, you know, local prep or, or, you know, even you have warehouse people or VAs, um, it has to at least be a sibling of the spotlight effect is, the situations where it, you let yourself think that the people that you hire care about your business as much as you do. You know, it's easy to, to, you know, just kind of let yourself believe that they don't, they don't care about the business as much as you do. It's, it, it's just, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes whether it be their performance or something, something they did and it's like, you know, you can't get your head wrapped around how they could possibly do that. And, and, you know, or, or how they could risk that or, or, you know, you know, create the, the potential to lose money like that. It's it's because they're not thinking about it. You know, mm -hmm. they're not thinking about you as much as you think they are. And they're not thinking about the business as much as you think they are. Nope. No, they're thinking about what time am I going to get home to watch the next episode of whatever they're watching, you know, or, right. or what is happening this weekend that I'm going to take my mind off of work. Like, I don't know. I think that as you know, we as I'm going to use the term entrepreneurs because you know, we are as Amazon seller. Amazon is just our, our channel, our distribution channel. But we're cut from a different cloth. We're the only ones who wake up thinking about our business, eat lunch thinking about our business, and then go to bed thinking about our business. Uh, you know, most other people are like, dude, how can I get out of here at 4.30 instead of 5 uh, and, and not get not get caught? So Exactly. Uh, you know, another, this a huge one, uh, let's talk about social media. Um, and, and there's a, 
there's a bunch of different branches uh, uh, on this tree. Um, you know, social media absolutely 100% exacerbates uh, the spotlight effect. Um, and kind of like what you post on social media and then the effect that social media that you view yourself, you know, it, it, this one is, this works both ways, uh, it, you know, in my opinion, um, you know, if, if you're kind, if you're trying to, uh, you know, establish some sort of brand or, you know, build any kind of following, um, <laughs> we've seen the metrics and, and, you know, both of us have, have uh, you know, we're trying to build our following on, on social media. Um, not nearly as many people as, as you would like are, are seeing your stuff, you know, yep. it's, uh, you know, there are even, uh, you know, social media uh, platforms that, that you can subscribe to where, where, you know, you can schedule posts for later and you can kind of build a queue up and, and have them, uh, uh, you know, a lot of them have a feature to where they'll actually, put older but well-performing tweets or posts or Instagram stories and, you know, they'll actually repost your good ones after a period of time, you know, or, or fill in space or whatnot. And, and I, at least me, when I first saw that feature, I was, I was like, no, I, there's no way I'm not, I'm not doing that, you know? And, and it's, but then when you read up on it, it, and, and you realize the vast majority of your followers never saw it in the first place. You know, yep. And the ones that did probably aren't going to remember that you posted the same thing last month. You know, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's far more reusable your content, uh, than, than you realize. Um, you know, and then the other way, as far as like when you're consuming social media content, um, you know, I, we both have, have children that are, are coming up on, um, periods uh, in, in their life where they're going to start being exposed to uh, uh, social media in some format. Uh, you know, it has a, a has a, a deeper effect as far as, uh, you know, self-confidence and whatnot. It, it, you know, it's, it's so easy to not realize that we're seeing a projection mm -hmm. from, from social media, you know, and then the cumulative effect that that has, you know, whether, you know, whether it be, you know, my daughter following friends, um, you know, or, or, you know, if she ever gets into, you know, she watches some YouTube shorts and stuff like that. And it's, you know, it's scary enough. Or if it's me following a bunch of Amazon FBA related content on Twitter and, and you know, you see orange bars, like tell me, tell me you can't, you haven't looked through, you know, a Facebook group, which is all Amazon FBA related and, and you know, seeing the big, those big numbers and, and people posting orange bars, which are, which you can't even, you're not even sure that what the path is to get to that kind of volume, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, and then that can have negative effects, you know, as you, you know, you think you're not doing enough, you know, and, and, you know, you're not scaling fast enough, or maybe I'm not buying enough inventory or, you know, or, or you're just frustrated. Like, what is this person doing that? I'm not, I don't, I don't get it. You know, when, when in reality, you, you may be scaling at the proper pace for you, you know, you, you may not have cash flow problems that that person does, you know, and, and they're not going to share their cash flow problems on social media, you know, because they're Most likely, obviously they're only getting the greatest hits, you know, and uh, you know, it's rare that, that, you know, you, you hear uh, you know, usually you only hear the stories of, you know, say like a, somebody's plum card got shut off and, and they're like, Hey, we, we need a $25,000 payment before uh, we open your card back up. And uh, you know, usually it's, it's those posts are only complaining about American express, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, you don't, uh, you know, you don't hear the backstory. There's probably more going on, um, you know, that then their, their caption on social media will, will let on. Right. Absolutely. <clears throat> Next, we should talk a little bit about, your competition who is going to be on social media right along with you. Uh, you know, it, oftentimes Amazon sellers, I think, I think maybe especially Amazon sellers, uh, might feel that the competition is constantly watching, constantly copying all your moves. Uh, and in, in an age when storefront stalking is, uh, one of the sourcing methods du jour, uh, that, you know, that is certainly an understandable feeling. Uh, but 
you have to, you know, forget that, especially when prices tank and, and things like that. Uh, you know, you can say, oh, well, I found this first and, and how many people are, are storefront stalking me? Less than you think. Yeah. More than you'd probably like. Hey guys, wanted to take a quick second and thank you for listening to the Clear the Shelf podcast. My magnanimous co-host Chris Rasick has put together a gift for you for being a listener. It's called the Monthly Goal Tracking Spreadsheet and it's free. The spreadsheet will help you break down and track how much you've purchased, which should be a leading indicator of how much you will sell. And then you'll be able to track how much you've sold as well as your estimated monthly profit on a daily basis. This will all feed into the daily averages so you can ensure that you're on track to meet your goals each and every month. Grab it for free today over at cleartheshelf.com forward slash goal dash tracking. Thanks again for being a listener. Now back to the show. Our storefront stalking you, but less than you probably think are actually doing it. Uh, and so I think as sellers, as entrepreneurs, we really need to, to realize that you know, we need to recognize that there is this spotlight effect and we need to make sure we're staying focused. You know, we're, we're making all the right moves. We're working on the fundamentals uh, in our business, you know, and we're doing what we need to do to move the needle forward. Uh, and I, I talk about this quite a bit in, in the OA challenge when it comes to sourcing, you should have some rules in place uh, for sourcing. You should have some rules in place for repricing. Uh, you should have some rules in place as to when you're going to liquidate. Uh, and of course, those rules can be a little bit malleable, uh, you know, because circumstances change. But as long as they're based on the fundamentals of a good Amazon business, you don't really have to worry about much else. Uh, you can you can pivot when necessary. Uh, you can do you can try out new things. Uh, but if you stay focused on those rules that you've created, you can take out the emotion. You can take out the worrying about uh, how many other people are stalking your storefront, uh, and you can take out you know all kinds of other mistakes that can be made because you're trying to overthink things. Um, and and you know this was just one of them. So. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, pricing on Amazon erodes. That's that's just a fact. You know, it, it, it's not somebody, you know, uh, with somebody working on the inside of Amazon feeding your ASINs to them. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, think about how often, you know, when you're sourcing yourself, how many ASINs do you find where there are no FBA offers and, and you have the listing all to yourself? You know, if you didn't mm -hmm. create it yourself, it, it's pretty rare. You know, and, and you got to realize that everyone has different pricing strategies. Everyone has different repricers, even, uh, you know, the software themselves. They have different uh, minimum pricing philosophies and, and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, I I've heard of a guy who does retail arbitrage at a fairly high level and out of the box, you know, before any liquidation events or anything like that, his minimum is a zero percent ROI. Now we can, we can discuss what, you know, that's stupid. You know, I, I can't stand that. What's he thinking? Uh, you know, and let's, let's move all that to the side. Okay. When I first heard it, my very first thought was that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but then when I took a step back, I was like, I understand he's optimizing for speed. He's optimizing for turnover. Uh, and in the first, you know, 30 or 60 days, he's willing to just break even on some inventory. We know that's not going to happen on everything. You know, there are going to be things that price upward. If you're using a good repricer, uh, there's going to be things that maybe priced, you know, maybe you source it at 50% ROI and it comes down to 30% ROI. Uh, so of course he's not going to just break even on everything, you know, but that's what he's willing to do. Uh, and, and he stays focused on his business model, no matter what anybody thinks or says or, or tells him, uh, because it's, it's worked for him. So, but outside of that, if you guys want to call him an idiot, I, I won't stop you doing that either. <laughs> <laughs> That's one pricing strategy where you, you can't have any traces of the spotlight effect because right. you're not going to be popular. Um, so in, uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, performance evaluation. Um, 
you know, Amazon sellers, uh, you know, we, we can overestimate uh, the the, uh, the importance of a single performance or or, uh, or a single uh, well, yeah, performance of your product, you know, a, a specific buy that you made. Um, you know, again, we get into the hesitancy, you know, that's we've talked about it before where it's, you know, I, I, I've said always consider what's the worst that can happen. You know, it, it's kind of like a supplement to uh, uh, the reasoning behind uh, uh, going wide, but not deep. You know, it's it's you're making decisions so that worst case scenario isn't devastating. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's um, I, I always think of it that way. You know, it, it's what's worst case scenario and, and how bad is it going to hurt? You know, and, and it's I think if more people thought of that uh, scenario, you know, it, it, it uh, a lot of these questions and a lot of the hesitancy would, would just kind of take care of itself. Um, you know, but you're you're basically placing too big of a, a emphasis on, you know, maybe one poorly performing piece of your inventory, um, you know, or think of it this way. How, how many people do you uh, have you heard talk about Amazon and the things that happen to their account? as if they had a, a secret silent uh spy which is actually their arch nemesis uh that watches everything they do and and is just waiting for them to slip up so they can knock their account health rating or you know slash their ipi as much as possible and you know i mean I, I, tons of people are like that you know they, they, they think amazon has such a grasp on their entire marketplace when you know, I, I, I tend to think that uh, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing most of the time. That is exactly the phrase that was in my mind. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say that I would say that, that that probably happens a lot more than we think at Amazon uh, because it is so big, you know, because they have so many different departments. There's, you know, are there black hat things that happen? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and we hear about those ones because humans only only tell the bad things. You know, Amazon just uh, Amazon blocked 800,000 attempts at making new new Amazon seller accounts recently. You know, uh, but we don't hear about the 20,000, uh, you know, new sellers who are really going to try to actually uh, have a positive business that, that did make it through. Uh, you know, we hear about the. <clears throat> And you know, we hear about the the lawyer who paid bribes, you know, but we don't hear about the lawyer who actually helped a legitimate business, you know, uh, handle, you know, a problem that was legitimate. You know, it, it's unfortunate, but that's, that's just the way it is. Um, uh, let, let's move on a little bit to I innovation and how this how spotlight can, or the uh, or sorry, decision making. Uh, so. Sometimes if you are a victim of the spotlight effect, uh, it can influence the way that you make decisions uh, and it kind of kind of can make you uh, try to make a decision or, or feel the pressure to make a decision that might impress others, whether that's others in your family, whether that's uh, others on social media or in your uh, your circle, uh, you know, whoever it is. Uh, but and that can lead to poor decision making. Uh, I think a good example of this recently is. Uh, and we've talked about this for the past two or yeah, well, two of the recent podcast episodes is people moving to wholesale too quickly, you know, uh, where if you if you do pay attention to social media and where Amazon sellers hang out, uh, there are a couple of things that it seems to be on everyone's lips as of late. Number one, OA is dead. It's saturated. There's no money to be made. Get out while you can, uh, you know, before the, the fire exits get get locked up and, and sealed off. Uh, and also, I'm switching to wholesale, like immediately. Uh, and it, I think that the spotlight effect does play a part there, you know. Well, all the people who I look to, to for advice for you know what they're doing in their business they're all moving to wholesale i i better do it too i, I want to keep up with them i want to make sure that you know i'm i'm doing the right thing and uh and things like that when that may not be the right thing for you you, you may not have 
the cash flow for it. You may not have the bank roll uh, for it. Maybe you don't have the sales chops. It, 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 these I'm not saying this to to tell you know people who maybe are brand new or thinking about pivoting to wholesale to not do it. If it's the right decision for you, it's the right decision for you. But there are things to think about. You know, uh, it, you you do need to have a little bit more money th than you need to have with OA. Uh, sales chops are absolutely going to help you because if you know if hearing a no from someone is like a knife in the gut then wholesale may not be the right move until you can you can withstand those barbs. Uh, and, and so you need to think about that and not just follow those who, you know, that you might want to impress or, or tell that, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to wholesale uh, just because it sounds good. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, or there's some perceived hierarchy, you know, it, it's where... It, you know, arbitrage that's for beginners and, and, you know, people get into wholesale and they, they, you know, they make negative comments on, on, you know, Oh, that's, you know, I'm, I'm wholesale now, you know, like, Oh, you're, so. you're just a reseller. Well, yeah. You're so are wholesalers, you know, <laughs> right. Uh, and reseller exactly. should not be the dirty word that it is because some of the biggest corporations in the world are, are just resellers, Walmart, Target, Kroger, you know, sure, these companies might have some of their own private label brands, uh, but their private label brands are really uh, just their best-selling SKUs that they go and put their own their own label on. Uh, they're not doing any differentiating or anything like that, other than knocking the price down a little bit. Uh, which, if you ask any whole uh, any private label seller, that's the lowest form of private label is what these grocery stores are doing. Uh, you know, so I don't know. I, I wish there was not this, you know, I, I don't know. It, it seems like there's a division, you know, you're right. People who are into wholesale, are like, oh, ew, <laughs> you do arbitrage, <laughs> you know, and then people who do private labor are like, what's wrong with you? You're not building your own brand. Uh, I think that we should really try to be a little bit more cooperative, uh, you know, because there is, there is a place for all of us. Uh, you know, is there, is there good things about PL? Yeah, absolutely. The, the exit, the ability to exit, a, a, a good private label product is awesome. Uh, if you're doing wholesale, the ability to exit, uh, when you have, uh, you know, brand exclusive contracts, really, really great. Uh, you know, when it comes to arbitrage, you know what we've got? We've got the ability to pivot on a dime, uh, which you don't really have when you have to go a little bit deeper in wholesale. Uh, you know, when you maybe are buying an entire carton of private label products from China, uh, you know, we have the ability to pivot. We have the ability to create cash flow much faster than some of these other businesses at times. Uh, and, uh, and we have the ability to take advantage of uh, trends much faster. You know, when when you and I uh, did you ever sell yeast during during mm -hmm. COVID? Okay, yep. you know, when you and I are uh, going out and clearing shelves of yeast, you know, wholesale sellers are waiting for uh, the supply chain to catch up. You know, uh, so everybody plays a role, and and everyone should. I think should appreciate uh, the differences, you know, and the similarities between the different business models. Exactly. Sorry, soapbox put away now. <laughs> so we started with uh, the fear of failure uh, when we started talking about spotlight effect, um, and we'll end it with with something closely related. Um, is uh, let's talk about innovation, right? And it, it's you know the fear of failure can can keep you from even getting started. Uh, spotlight effect. <laughs> can keep you from innovating and, and, you know, reaching, um, reach somewhere out, outside of your comfort zone. Um, you know, it can make sellers hesitant to take risks or, uh, pursue ideas that they have. Um, uh, you know, so, so managing and understanding the spotlight effect could, uh, you know, it can help you be more confident, you know, everything, I think everything we've talked about, uh, you know, managing the spotlight effect can, can add to your, your, uh, your confidence for sure. Um, you know, we, a lot of the, the books that we read um, talk about the importance of diversification. Um, 
you know, several books, uh, they, you know, the average millionaire has uh, seven streams of income, right? That's, that's uh, one of my favorites that I've, uh, that I see repeatedly in, in seven, diff several different books. Um, so, you know, but the spotlight effect, uh, you know, it, it's, you can kind of stay in your comfort zone, you know, and, and that's, I don't say that as a positive, you know, and, and if you, if you never reach out and you never, you know, kind of diversify, um, you, you could be at risk or at the very least, you're not living up to the potential. Right. And, and obvious example, um, is, is myself. Um, you know, I reached out to you, um, uh, a longer time ago than I've actually had the company uh, because of the spotlight effect, I'm sure, and the fear of failure myself. But I had the idea of, uh, you know, I, I, there was some, there was a point in time where um, I, I was subscribed to Leadless and um, I didn't have the confidence in my own sourcing ability quite yet. You know, I was still learning and, and, and trying to get better all the time. But I, you know, the prospect of, of being on my own to generate my own products to buy uh it, it was frightening you know it, it i wasn't real confident yet um but so i had an idea uh, of a weekend lead list you know what if what if there were leads out there that were specifically saturday and sunday because they, i reached a point where i would get my friday list and i almost felt like disappointed you know and it's like Oh, I gotta, I gotta wait till Monday, you know, because, the, because in my mind, you know, I felt more confident in a company's list because they were vetted and, and, you know, I kind of assumed that the people vetting them were better sellers and, and more experienced or, or, or whatever, you know, so I, I trusted those a little bit more than, than on my own. Cause it was, it was scary. Um, so it's almost like they came with a seal of approval, you know, so the thought of Friday's list being the last one I get until Monday, um, it was deflating, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, especially if you've got the capital and, and, you know, you, you want to add to your catalog. And, um, I felt like there was a need there, you know, so I ran it by you to see if, if, if that was, you know, a good idea or not, you said it was, um, and we kind of chopped it up a little bit about it. And, and, you know, the, the weekend lead list, you know, my idea for, for my company was to be a supplement, you know, I'm not a direct competitor. Um, you know, I, I, I think lead lists are great. I'm a huge fan of them in general. Um, but this would act as a supplement, you know, so basically you could have leads seven days a week. You'd have your regular ones Monday through Friday. That's the vast majority of the lead list that, uh, that I come across and that I've subscribed to. And then you could have a supplement that would fill in those two days. So, you know, you wouldn't, uh, the, the narcos meme where, you know, uh, Pablo Escobar is, you know, in, sad and, and on his little swing and whatnot, you know, so you wouldn't have that feeling on Friday, you know, and you can kind of keep momentum. Um, that was, I thought that was innovative, you know, and, and had I let the spotlight effect and, and obviously you helped me, that's why I ran it by you, you know, cause I wasn't going to run with it on my own. But um, I think that's an example of innovation that, that could have been stunted if I had let the spotlight effect, um, grab hold. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I like, and you know, another, I think another, even, uh, another way to think about this too, is if you can allow the spotlight effect to keep you from trying something, e even just a new sourcing method, you know, uh, mm -hmm. because someone might think, Oh, well, I'm going to screw up. I, I I'm going to be, I'll be you know, raw here. Uh, I didn't always know all the things about Keepa and Keepa product finder and things like that. You know, there was a time when I had no idea. Uh, and if I had allowed the spotlight effect to really take hold, uh, and, you know, and remembered all those people laughing at me on the, on the hill, on the ski hill, uh, I never would have taken the time to really try to understand, you know, what, how powerful that can be. Uh, and so if you get those ideas in your head, uh, you really got to make sure you get over the, the worry that someone's going to point and laugh at you, uh, because it happens far, far fewer times than you think it will. Um, all right. Uh, 
we're pretty deep into all this, but I want to get through Occam's razor as well and, and hopefully hopefully have people stick around. But let's talk a little bit about Occam's razor. So first of all, we, we've got to define it, of course. Occam's razor, uh, which is named after a 14th century logician uh, and Franciscan friar. I bet you this guy was just a ton of fun. Uh, his <laughs> name was William Occam. Uh, and uh, it's a problem-solving principle or framework that states when competing hypotheses, hypotheses or explanations, uh, the simplest one is usually the best. And so it encourages you to eliminate unnecessary assumptions or components when trying to solve a problem or make a decision. Uh, and so really, Occam's razor, it, it favors simplicity. Okay, uh, it asserts that the most straightforward explanation or solution with the fewest assumptions is generally going to be more effective. Uh, and I am behind this 100%. Okay, Absolutely. and I'm just gonna, before we get into like some of the ways that you can use this in, in your business, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make one, one thing, one example that I think will be the most clear for Amazon sellers. Yeah, I, I have been trying to make a little bit more content about Keepa on specifically Twitter, for example, because I I'll read through, uh, you know, and I'll see people talking about uh, reading these donkey leg refractions uh, in their in their Keepa graph and uh, and all this stuff, and and I'm like, no, 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 I'm like you are way overthinking this, uh, and you really need to come down to a much simpler answer, okay, because. Yeah, I don't know. You're trying to throw all these fancy terms and uh, and you know day trading or swing trading uh, kinds of um, I don't know chart reading into something that, in my opinion, uh, Keepa graphs can be very very simple. Does it sell? Is it profitable? You know, and that's really all you've got to know. Uh, but let, let's get into, let's get into a little bit more of it. Yeah. It's, it's the, it's the antidote to, to overthinking essentially. Um, yeah, it's a Occam's razor. Um, let's talk about idea validation. Um, you know, focusing on the core problem the business is trying to solve. Um, you know, the simplest solution that addresses it is, is usually the best. Um, you know, it, it, we tend to, um, tend to add more to it, uh, than, than is really there. Um, you know, and, and that's true with a lot of the, the, the books that we read and, and, um, you know, business related, you know, a lot of it talks about just boiling things down, stripping it away to the core issue, you know, um, Simon Sinek, he, you know, start with why, you know, th that book is, is all about it, you know, just stripping it all the way down to the reason that you started the business, you know, the, the ultimate goal, you know, and kind of keeping that in mind, he wrote a whole book on that. Um, so that, that's, that's one of the ways, um, that the, this framework can help. Yeah. Uh, the next one I think is, is prioritizing tasks. Uh, you know, Amazon sellers, and I'll, I'll get into an example here in a moment, but Amazon sellers can apply Occam's razor to kind of prioritize your daily tasks or, or tasks that need to be handled in your business uh, by helping you focus on the things that are the most straightforward, the things that are going to have the highest impact, and the things that are really going to move the needle in your business. Um, you know, I, I happened to see something recently where uh, people were talking about how many hours they had sourced, uh, you know, and, and everybody was kind of listing, you know, I, I got this many hours, I got this many hours, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, I happen to see another conversation of all these things that were needed, needing to be handled in, in an Amazon business. Now, are there a lot of important things in an Amazon business that need to be handled? Yes, absolutely. There's account health stuff, there's inventory management, uh, you know, there's repricing that needs to be reconfigured every now and again, uh, you know, and, and all these just all these things that will pop up. But I mean, what is the thing that is the number one driver in your business? You know, what's the what's the number one revenue generating uh, activity? It's sourcing. 
And when I see someone say, oh, well, I spent, you know, two hours or I spent four hours sourcing, uh, you know, but in total, I, I worked for 20 or 30 hours this week. Well, we need to go back to Occam's razor and figure out, you know, what is actually something that should be prioritized. And I think those numbers should be backwards. You know, if you're working 20 hours a week in your business, because this is a, maybe this is a side hustle or, or you know, maybe, maybe you're semi-retired or whatever it is, you know, I would imagine that 10 to 12 hours should be spent sourcing and the other, you know, eight hours should be spent on, you know, bookkeeping and, and all of that. And the other thing is, is you need to hire those out as quickly as possible. Of course, we don't want you to go broke, but uh, you need to buy back your time because that's what I mean, that's what having a business is all about. You know, you want to generate revenue. And then you want to take that revenue and you want to buy back as much of your time as you can. Uh, and I, I think that sometimes uh, we really overthink it uh, rather than using Occam's razor to figure out kind of what we need to do. And I am super guilty of this. So I'm not just pointing fingers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, they say the, you make your money on the buy, you know, and, and it's, uh, you know, I think part of that is, is what you just talked about. You know, it's, it's, that's the money maker. you know, it, it's, you want to perform the tasks that, that are the most valuable, you know, and oftentimes sourcing is it, uh, it kind of feeds into, you know, the financial management aspect of, uh, uh Occam's razor, you know, it, it's, you talked about, you know, you calculate your, your hourly way, you know, you can calculate the wage that you want to make yourself. Um, and then you can kind of use that as the basis for outsourcing, um, you know, the, the lower value tasks, you know, that's a way of keeping it simple. Um, and then you see the other way, you know, you see sellers that, that basically, uh, subscription themselves to death, you know, and, and, and it's, you know, how many people are, are like, Oh, just, you know, this, this one, one more tool, maybe this one tool will, will break it all wide open for me. And, and, you know, they, they put, they put so much emphasis and, and, you know, the, there's not, there's not one thing that's going to break it through. You know, you're, you're, you're overcomplicating it. You're, you know, you're muddying the waters when you should go back to, to simplifying things, you know, outsource, you know, the, the low stuff, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the stuff that you shouldn't be doing yourself, you know, focus on the, the highest revenue generating tasks, um, and, and start there and then, and branch out from there, you know? So Absolutely. it kind of, it kind of works both ways. I was, to be quite honest, I was expecting a, a pumpkin sized shot at a popular book in the, in the financial <laughs> space. <laughs> Uh, uh, you see, I, we're already if we hadn't spent so much time on the spotlight effect, I, I can't I can't open that tangent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so another way you can use the uh, you can use Occam's razor is in, in streamlining your operations. And, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be another throwback to an example I used just just a few minutes ago. Uh, but the best businesses are often as lean as they can possibly be. Heck, there is an entire management philosophy called lean management. And it's all about simplifying unnecessary processes, uh, focusing on automating repetitive tasks, uh, and optimizing workflows for efficiency. Now, if you own a warehouse uh, or own a 3PL or, or a prep center uh, or have your prep in-house, these are definitely things that you need to think about. You know, if you're looking at workflows and drawing, you know, all these spaghetti maps, and if you aren't sure what a spaghetti map is, go Google that, uh, and that'll take you down a nice little rabbit hole. Uh, you know, oftentimes the best thing to do for a, uh, a lean or efficient warehouse is going to be the simplest thing and not, you know, not all these fancy technical terms that you'll hear some uh, Six Sigma black belts uh, talk about sometimes. All right. Uh, but the other thing that I, I think about, too, is is the sourcing. 
You know, I, I'll talk about that donkey leg refraction in the Keepa graph again that people want to talk about. Or, oh, well, I've got to check, you know, I've got to check the sales rank. And then I've got to go and look at three different estimated sales uh, calculators. Uh, but then I also need to check the offers tab to make sure that, uh, you know, inventory is actually moving from other sellers. And then I need to go and look at the reviews and are, are they actually going up and are they USA based? Uh, and now we've just done four things to see if something on Amazon has velocity. Okay. When in reality, does your BSR chart, does the seller rank, does it, does it have a heartbeat? You know, is it moving up and down? All right. We got velocity. Okay. Are the number of reviews ticking up and to the right in the, in the sales or in the graph? Okay. We've got some velocity. All right. Stop overthinking it because the simplest answer gets the question done. And now we can move on to the next step. All right. Uh, and, and so that's really how we should try to streamline as many operations because so here's the biggest thing for me, especially when it comes to sourcing and being able to streamline your sourcing is the fact that selling on Amazon, especially as an arbitrage seller, selling more is a function of getting to bat more frequently. How do you get to bat more frequently? You look at more products. Okay. How do you look at more products in the same amount of time? You get faster at it, which means you've got to simplify it down as much as you possibly can. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I heard, I heard someone say, uh, in a, it, it's mid April. Right. And I heard someone say, Ooh, I really don't like those couple of days back in, in late January on that keep a graph. Like, <laughs> really? <laughs> like, is that, is that, is that really uh, that's influencing your decision? Um, yeah. And then I, I had a conversation um, I, with somebody that, that uh, bought a lead list from me and there was uh, there's another ASIN with the brand owner on it Um the only seller, um, you know, and, and, and he reached out to me and, and he's a newer seller. So I'm, I, you know, I'm not gonna, um, I won't drag him, uh, you know, too bad, but he, he called that the legit listing, you know, and then he, I took exception to him later saying, uh, something about a costly error. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so I, I had a bit of an attitude when I, when I replied to him, um, it turns out the listing that was on my lead list, what had, five years of, of keep a history uh, the air quotes legit listing with the brand owner only on it was only three years old. Mm -hmm. um, and Amazon was on the older listing, the one that I had shared. That's the one they chose to come in and stock on. So I took issue with legit, <laughs> you know, and the implication that the ACE and I shared was illegitimate. Um, you know, it, but basically, uh, so, but at the end of the email, I, I summed up to him, I, you know, I said, speaking of pumpkin sized, uh, uh, connotations and, and, and whatnot, uh, I said, not everything is going to be a replen, um, you know, and, and I certainly don't market my leads as replens. I, that word doesn't come into play. It's, it's nowhere in my copy of, of anywhere that, that I've written my website, my, you know, product descriptions, anything like that. Uh, I, and I said, you know, sometimes there are going to be situations uh, where you, you find a coupon, you find a code, you buy 10 or 20 units, you make some money and you move on. Right. It's as simple as that sometimes, right. Not everything has to be a replen. Uh, it, it, I don't even know what that word means anymore. It's just a marketing term anymore, you know? And I said, you know what, it, you know, put it in your leads database and maybe down the road, you find another coupon or another code and you buy some more and you sell those and you make a little bit more money. I said, but I'll tell you what, I'm still not calling that a replen at that point. I'm calling that simply good data management. Mm -hmm. You know, sure, you bought it again, but sometimes you just get in and out and, and just keep it simple. Like, you know, like these, I don't know. I, I mean, I know there, there's processes in place and, and you know, there, there's good things that can be taught, but I don't, I don't think you can hunt for replens. 
in, in general, overall, I, you know, a, a replen is discovered sometime after your test buy, you know, it, mm-hmm. it, it, hopefully if you're doing that, you know, it, they, they kind of establish themselves. You know, I don't, I, I don't know how these people are selling courses and stuff, uh, you know, saying we're, we're going to hunt for replens, you know, it, it's, that seems like marketing more than uh, anything uh, with merit. It is. It, it is. It, and I mean, I get it. What What's not more attractive than, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to source and everything that I source is going to be something that I sell for the next six months or a year. Uh, right. Anybody who, nobody should, should fall for that. Okay. Because you're spot on. Those replens, they're just a function of you doing what you should be doing anyway, you know, finding exactly. products to sell. You know, it's just, it's a natural part of the process. Uh, and all replens are going to be, uh, they're going to be different. You know, <clears throat> I, I did a, I did a live, um, I did a video for, uh, the folks over at the buy uh, the other week. And they're like, Hey, would you mind coming on and, and talk about how to use lead lists properly? Because le- let's be honest, if you go on Twitter, lead lists get bashed more than they get talked about positively. Okay. Uh, and I, I would say maybe a little less on Facebook, maybe, maybe about equal on Instagram. But the thing is, is nobody ever talks about, you know, other than they just talk about price tanking. Nobody is ever like, Oh, well, how could I use a lead list differently? Okay. Uh, and after that talk, someone signed up for two lead lists immediately. I, I don't sell them. They're not mine. Uh, you know, but, uh, the whole thing is that you're not ever going, or what I was, sorry, what I was getting at there is while I was doing this, I went through some of my old leads. So I took that lead list and I typed in the brand name of the first lead on the lead list, uh, typed it into my management system and I pulled back 13 leads from the same brand. Sure enough, one of them that was two years old was profitable. So, I mean, replens really are just a function of going out and sourcing. Uh, so yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about partnership decisions and the, and Occam's razor. So when you consider potential partnerships and, and I know a lot of people will be like, oh, well, that's never going to happen, but yes, it is. Okay. I also thought partnerships would never happen in this type of business, but now I have several Chris, you know, being a partner on this podcast, uh, you know, I've got yeah, other people who are partners in other things. Uh, and so you need to use Occam's razor a little bit, or may want to think about using Occam's razor to evaluate the benefits and risks of each, co- each collaboration, uh, and choosing kind of the simplest and most effective option that aligns with, with your goals. So for example, Chris came to me with the idea of, Hey, let's do a podcast. It's been something I'd been thinking about. I've even talked about. Uh, you know, but I wasn't going to, I knew I wasn't going to do it on my own. I, I kind of, I needed someone who, uh, you know, was willing to, I don't know, go toe to toe oratorily with me. Uh, if we could use some big words there, uh, and Chris fit the bill, you know? And so it was a, it was a good match, uh, you know, and then there are other things that I do where, uh, other people are a good match. And so, uh, yeah, use Occam's razor when you're thinking about a partner. And, and and by partner, it can be someone that you source with. You know, it could be someone that you uh, share leads with. It could be someone where you bird dog each other. And, you know, if you're, you're gated in something, you know, uh, you share with them. If they're gated, they share with you. Uh, there's all kinds of different ways that a partnership looks like. Uh, but make sure that you're... Uh, using Occam's razor to kind of figure out the benefits or even the the drawbacks of working with a particular partner. Yep. And joining a mastermind, you know, a mm-hmm. lot of people overthink that or they think they're going to expose some, you know, uh, uh, crucial element of their own business, uh, you know, instead of simply looking at the the power of, you know, getting to know other sellers and, and some of your peers and, you know, combining, you know, putting your heads together to, to grow and, and, and solve your own problems and uh, become better entrepreneurs overall. Um, it, it, 
talk about the business model. You know, let's talk about, uh, you know, simply, uh, you know, the designs of your operation itself, you know, um, when you're deciding what to do and, and, you know, if you apply Occam's razor, um, you know, just pick the most straightforward operation. You know, it, it, the key is you want to maximize your revenue and minimize, uh, you know, the, the complexity, you know, and basically make it as easy to run as possible, you know, and, and we talked about, you know, outsourcing stuff, um, you know, you have to be able to teach it if you're going to outsource it, you know, so, so that, that makes it all the more important to keep things simple. You know, it's, uh, uh, uh what did, what did I hear? Uh, somebody said something, you know, you want to be able to, somebody who really knows something, if you know it inside and out, uh, the true test is if you could explain it to your grandmother, <laughs> you know, which is, which I thought was, was pretty good. Um, you know, and, and that's not a, you know, it's not a weakness keeping it simple like that. That's, you know, this was, this was presented as a true test of knowing something, you know, actually mm -hmm. knowing it is being able to simplify it so that you can explain it, uh, you know, in, in plain terms. Yeah. yeah th I got a really good example of this. So my son came home from school the other day, or, uh, I picked him up from school, uh, and I'm like, Hey, you know, what'd you learn about in school today? And he's like, daddy, I learned about arthropods. Uh, and I'm like, Oh, cool. You know, what, what are arthropods? Uh, and he, he gives me, he gives me the nine year old version of what an arthropod is. Uh, and then he's like, daddy, could you share with me, uh, you know, some more examples and could you teach me a little bit more about this? Uh, and in the moment I could not, it's been a, it's been a little while since, uh, you know, third grade biology or, or <laughs> science class. And, and so I was like, well, I'll tell you what I said, you give me an hour and then I will teach you about arthropods. You know, I had to I had to brush up on it, but but then I was able to learn enough from a National Geographic uh, article or two, or you know, Science.com article, uh, that I could then teach it to a nine year old again. You know, and kind of refresh that that memory. Uh, but that I don't know. That's kind of how I always decide whether or not I know a topic well enough. Is if I can, if my son asks me about it and I can explain it. Uh, enough that he stopped asking questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, let's let's talk about uh, hiring and team management a little bit. Occam's Razor uh, can kind of help Amazon sellers uh, to focus on hiring team members with the essential skills uh, and creating really simple organizational structures, uh, or what I like to call flat organizational structures. Actually, it's it's not something I like to call. That's it's just what they call it. Uh, and support efficient communication and decision making. Matter of fact, one of the things um, that I read recently, and I can't remember whether this was uh, Peter Drucker uh, or who it was, um, but they said that, or maybe it was Charlie Munger, they said that the most effective businesses in the world, no matter how big or small they are, have no more than six levels of, uh, of an organizational chart, okay? Uh, one, it may be seven, but you get to eight or 10 or more, uh, you know, levels in your org chart. Uh, and it, it ends up being a, a bad business. Okay. Because it just, there's too, too far spread out. Uh, and so in my opinion, what Occam's razor tells us to do, uh, is hire for the specialty. Okay. I don't necessarily think that you should have one employee who knows how to source and reprice and make a shipment and, 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 and I think that, you know, if you're, especially in a, a business like Amazon, where we can, uh, you know, we can hire people from anywhere in the world. You can have one person who focuses on sourcing and that's what they're really, really good at. Um, matter of fact, there are a couple of lead list folks that I know, and in their organization, they have one or two people who are really good at just manual sourcing and not only manual sourcing, uh, but just a particular style of manual sourcing. All right. So they're not doing, you know, they're not looking at all the sales and doing reverse sourcing and looking up brands in Keepa. They're literally just doing one method of manual sourcing. 
And then they have other people who just work on tactical arbitrage. And they have other people who only follow sales. Uh, you know, and and that's okay. You know, you can have three part-time VAs focusing on three different things, making your organization a little bit flatter, uh, you know, so that you have all these specialists. Uh, and typically what's going to happen is you're going to have people perform better because they get to just focus on one thing rather than the person who has to, you know, focus on 10 different things. Uh, so you said six layers on an org chart is the max? Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that is also the number of degrees to Kevin Bacon in the game. Yes, it is. That is, it is a, I, uh, I don't know how you connected those, but I, I like it. That's, there's got to be something there. So, but, uh, you know, you, you talk about specialization and, and, you know, the, the VA is working, uh, for that, that, uh, that company, um, you know, that's easily flipped into time management as well. Um, because I love how, uh, you know, we're, it's becoming more widely accepted that multitasking doesn't work and can't be done. Right. Um, you know, so, so we, and then think of all the productivity, you know, think of it, pull up any productivity article uh, on how to improve it or how to, you know, um, amplify your productivity and somewhere in it will be uh, a tip on uh, like deep work or, or focusing on something, you know, and, and it's, you know, whether it be the, you know, Pompadouro, uh, you know, technique, you know, and, and, but it's, it's all based on focusing on one specific thing, you know, and, and, uh, that's simple that, that, you know, that that's an application of Occam's razor right there is, is, is simply, you know, just taking your workload and, and, or taking your to-do list and, and just simplifying it and, and just, one at a time, you're not overcomplicating it and you can organize it however you want to, you know, it's, it's whether it, it you know, it's eat the frog, eat that frog philosophy, you know, where you do the, the, the most difficult task first, or, or you know, there's different ways to, to work it. But I think overall, you know, the, the common theme, you know, across the board is the, the focus, you know, the simplicity on one task, you know, whether it be the highest priority or, or, you know, I know some people go the opposite direction too. And they say, you know, get, get a couple easy ones crossed off, you know, and that builds some momentum and, um, you know, say it, 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 it's whatever works for you personally, as far as the, you know, the actual technique, but I think the theme is the same across the board. And, and that's essentially applying Occam's razor to productivity and time management. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, this I, this is a good episode. Uh, before we wrap it up, Chris, did you uh, do we got a, a quote of the week for this episode? We do. And, and you you foreshadowed Charlie Munger. Um, yeah, it, it, I think these two are related. And um, and I think this quote kind of ties both of them together. Um, here's the quote. Uh, we try more to profit from always remembering the obvious than from grasping the esoteric. It is remarkable how much long-term advantage people like us have gotten by trying to be consistently not stupid instead of trying to be very intelligent. That's again, Charlie Munger. And that is a good quote. I, I, I think you're, I think that really does kind of encapsulate, uh, you know, these two, these two things, uh, Occam's razor number one, because I think the whole point, if we were, if we were to Occam, Occam's razor, Occam's razor, the whole point of it is that, you know, it tries to make us make the less stupid decision uh, because typically trying to make it more and more complex makes it easier to fail, makes it easier not to follow through. Uh, and and it's easy to kind of give ourselves the delusion that this really complex decision that we're going to make is the right one when really it's the simple one that typically uh, is going to do the, the most work for us. So yeah, yeah. I, I like and it's that all, that. you know, it's all trying to stop overthinking, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's that it, it, this ties into so many different things that we've talked about, you know, the, where, you know, we talk about just getting started and, and yeah, there's, I can't remember the quote, but there was basically the, the most successful people take the idea and they start with the idea that they'll figure it out along the way. 
you know, mm-hmm. and, and people who let spotlight effect and don't utilize Occam's razor, that's, that's going to keep you from just getting started, you know, and, and, and getting any kind of momentum because you're going to need everything perfect before you start. And, and, you know, perfection is, is, uh, the enemy of, of progress and productivity. Absolutely. You know, I, I enjoyed this episode. I hope you guys did too. Uh, I know it f- might feel like it was a little bit in the weeds and, and things like that, but, um, yeah, as I, I know that Chris and I both really, we enjoy reading, we enjoy learning, we enjoy listening to people who are, are smarter than us and, uh, you know, being able to take some of the things that we learn, uh, you know, from biographies, podcasts, books that we're reading, things we're talking about, uh, and kind of bringing those over to the Amazon side. I, I don't know, I, I enjoy it uh, because I think it's something that not a whole lot of other uh content creators, podcasters, blog writers are really doing. And so hopefully, uh, hopefully this helps you in your business in, in some way or the other. Uh, would love to hear if that's the case or uh, if this is just something that's you know, not of interest at all. Uh, but I, I have a feeling that people might actually really, really enjoy this. So uh, without further ado, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys have a great week uh, and we will talk to you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to Clear the Shelf with Chris and Chris. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a screenshot on your phone and share to Facebook, Instagram, or your favorite FBA group. And be sure to tag me and let me know why you liked it and what you'd like to hear more from us in the future. Also, I'd like to give you some free gifts for listening. Head over to rabbittrailchallenge.com and repricerchallenge.com for some free courses to further your business. Thanks for listening.